On today's agenda, I'm going to begin by giving a, a brief introduction of why we built this solution, uh, followed up by Peter Stieg Nielsen, who is Phase One's product manager for cultural heritage, and Doug will do the majority of the webinar showing off the, the film scanning kit with a hardware and software uh, um, workflow. The film scanning and imaging uh, industry has always been driven by the commercial marketplace. Uh, for obvious reasons, it, it makes up the bulk of, of the commerce or the bulk of the, uh, of the people using this type of equipment. And when the film scanning market was strong, obviously manufacturers, inventors, designers, software developers um, put a lot of money and R&D into film scanning. Um, so there's a large investment in film scans, and there's a lot of options. And the obvious ones were drums and, and CCD-based systems. Drum scans have always set the bar uh, for these systems, um, and so that's sort of the highest uh, compare point. However, in the late 90s, as films started to be replaced by direct digital capture, such as scan backs and smaller array systems, manufacturing companies such as Kodak and Heidelberg stopped making their, you know, scanners or pre-press devices. And even uh, as of late, Cytex stopped making their scanner as well. Today, there are a few left. Uh, Imicon is one, Epson's one, there's a couple smaller companies. And you'll note that there's no real R&D going on in, in film scanning technologies to date. Uh, so that leads to problems with operating system, operating system support, uh, driver support, as well as physical hardware support. So which brings us back to why are we doing this? Um, obviously, we want to take a very modern approach to film scanning and not use the existing type of scanners on the market. Um, so. We noted that our cultural heritage cl uh, clients um, have huge stores of photographic, of photographic films of all formats and types. So we set out to make a solution that was based on the needs of our market, primarily safety to the original. Um, with the advent of high-resolution digital backs, we have instant capture, so it could deal with a high volume well. And also, these digital backs have incredibly high image quality. So these are all demanded by the service bureaus who serve um, the cultural heritage marketplace and as well as the preservation guidelines being put forth by the cultural heritage market. Fortunately, this technology has come a long way over the last couple of decades, so we got to skip the linear scan array of yesteryear and use direct capture systems. The scanning solutions that we make our modular component of our imaging solution suite. Pre our, in our first iteration of film scanning hardware, which is pretty simplistic, they were also very popular and being used internationally by cultural institutions as well as service bureaus across their speed and quality. We are always looking to improve upon what we do, so we came out with our new film scanning kit. And to talk a little bit more about this, um, about this advancement. Uh, we're going to have Doug Peterson, who is the product manager of this film scanning kit, go over the uh, advancement in hardware, which is going to ease material handling and, and speed, as well as the software, because we had long conversations with, Kat, with Phase 1 about optimizing their software for such purpose. So for now, I want to pass over the microphone to Peter Stieg, who is Phase 1's product manager for Culture Heritage. He has many years experience with desktop scanner technology and will add a lot of inter interesting information to this conversation. Peter? Thank you very much, Peter. Here's Peter Stig uh, joining in from phase one in uh, Copenhagen, actually a little north of Copenhagen. And um, I'm very happy and, and proud to be, to be part of this uh, session tonight. Uh, trans transmissive scanning has been, um, has been part of my um, work for many, many years. I was so fortunate as to start out on the um, on the desktop drum scanners back in the 90s uh, with, with ScanView, a Danish company at that time. And uh, uh, 
when it came to to uh, to scanning, transmitted scanning, uh, those days were the discussions of was this an RGB or was this a DMYK workflow? Should we be mounting uh, dry or in oil? And then um, uh, being the newcomers with the desktop drum scanners, we tried, uh, let's say, new things. But I have to say we were very happy when ICC turned up and, and, and got some uh, order into the discussions about how to manage uh, color workflow. That was a big thing. Then I moved on to, to Imacon, um, another Danish company uh, that invented the, the, the scanning without glass. And um, this produced a, a fantastic image quality uh, of the transmissive uh, materials. Uh, and on top of that, uh, at, at Imacon, the, the scanning and the workflow into a raw um, a raw capture was was part of the agenda and a very important one, um, I believe. However, uh, those days we had to face the fact that um, moving on to cultural heritage institutions and projects where volume counts, uh, the Imacon scanner could not, uh, uh, let's say, compete. It could not could not bring in the the volumes uh, needed. Today it's a, it's a big pleasure to be uh, to be part of the alliance uh, phase one and digital transitions where where the combined forces have been able to come up with solutions for the cultural heritage that uh, achieve on the one side very very high image quality based on the camera systems we achieve a very high performance um, based both on the fact that we are shooting with the, with the camera system and by the fact that we are controlling the whole system using uh, Capture One. Uh, again, we are, of course, digging to the raw workflow. So anything captured is kept in the raw. Uh, you have, at all times, your full asset available for repurposing or reuse uh, for a number of different output uh, purposes uh, as they may turn up. And uh, it has been a pleasure to to be part of the development of a specific uh, cultural heritage edition of Capture One. We call it Capture One CH for cultural heritage, which um, Digital Transitions has been uh, a major player in in defining. And um, and uh, over the past couple of years, uh, this has been developed to come out in December of 2014. Half a year into its life is going very well. And uh, on top of, 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 of the achievements of, of image quality and performance and so on, uh, I trust that, that uh, with the sound base of, of, of Capture One, we've achieved uh, a very nice use interface, intuitive work with difficult things like, for example, um, scanning of, of negatives. Uh, Doug is going to talk about this, but uh, what I like a lot is the um, uh, our way of 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 uh, in, inverting um, negatives so that all our uh, tools for for setting up, setting up the scan uh, they work intuitively correct uh, with even negative uh, trans uh, transmissive materials and then I need to say that that we are looking at high performance high volume uh, scanning solutions even though it's a camera doing the catches. Uh, but we are not a robot. There needs to be some human interaction. And uh, in our opinion, we, we find this is the right way to make sure that we can cope with all the different uh, emulsions of film that has turned up over the years. So it's not just a one push, uh, do all. There needs to be some brains behind transmissive scanning. Uh, but once you apply that, we have a serious high performance high volume system. There are other um, important elements of Capture One CH. You see a few of them here on the slide uh, shown at this at this moment. Uh, I'll not get into the details. Uh, you can look further into that uh, on either the website of Digital Transition or, or Phase One. But uh, a number of very important uh, functionality uh, elements, both for post-processing and pre-processing, uh, have been added to phase to um, a capture one in order to uh, to achieve and, and give you uh, a high performance 
uh, tool for um, for uh, a reproductive uh, a camera system. So with these words, I would like to to hand back the microphone to uh, to Doug, and I look forward to uh, to follow um, the session as it as it moves on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. I must say on a personal note, it's been an absolute pleasure working uh, digital transitions with phase one on some of these Capture One Cultural Heritage tools. Uh, I, I'm very proud of what we've been able to create together, and I'm looking forward to creating even more and better tools in the future. Um, with that said, let's move on to the current uh, DT film scanning kit that has just uh, been released a few months ago. The first point is that this is a fully shipping and ready product. Uh, it's been available for about two months, and in that time, uh, we've already done both the order and install at several uh, institutions. I wanted to touch on two of those uh, in particular. In Los Angeles, the Disney Archive is using the new film scanning kit to digitize a set of four million transmissive assets. Uh, these are the sorts of large collections, not that you need to have four million, but the, the sorts of collections that we're looking at here that are more than just a few hundred negatives, more than a few hundred slides. But these very large collections, like their four million collection item, uh, item collection, are the types of uh, markets that we're aiming for with our equipment. We're looking for high durability, high throughput, and high ease of use. Uh, the Center for Creative Photography is sort of the other end of the spectrum. They do have a very large uh, collection, very many, uh, a very large number of items. But to say that they need absolute top quality is, is a bit of an understatement. They are the current house, and I guess uh, forever house, of the life works of Edward Weston, the life works of Ansel Adams, the life works of many of the most prestigious uh, North American photographers who have ever walked the earth. And their seminal works are housed in their archives, uh, their unknown works are housed in their archives, and digitizing those, it, it is not acceptable to digitize them fairly well or well. They must be digitized at an extremely high level of quality. And uh, I just wanted to read you a quote here from uh, Joe at the head of that project, uh, the digital projects coordinator there, he said, in the past I have used all kinds of scanners from flatbed to drum scanners and there is no comparison when considering the time, investment, and overall image sharpness and quality uh, in reference to our new system and uh, his use of it. So we're looking forward to adding some more customers here in the coming months, uh, delivering more systems, and we're certainly interested in speaking with anybody here on the call who is uh, interested in doing a a demo or a test and evaluation. So, why do we design our system? What are the advantages? Well, while the general film scanning market was being developed for mostly commercial purposes, mostly people shooting film for commercial purposes, we wanted to make a system that was really very flexible to the conservation, preservation, and digital heritage, uh, cultural heritage market. So our system uses conservation material handling. By default, our standard carriers do not require any contact within the image area on either the emulsion or the substrate side. So we use a magnetic carrier. It holds, uh, it, it suspends the, the film much in the way that the Imacon holders did. Nothing touches the front or the back of the film inside of the image area, only at the very edges where there's nothing there. We also didn't use any automatic feeders. It's our experience that automatic feeders will work very well 99% of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time. But if you're dealing with tens of thousands of objects, especially when the condition, size, and type of those condition, uh, sorry, when the size, condition, and type of those materials is constantly changing, uh, an automatic feeder risks damage by scratch or compression or twist uh, or other mishandling of the objects. Finally, our system allows the sort of diversity of size, shape, and material that you find in the cultural heritage collections that we've worked with. Uh, we can support glass plate negatives, lantern slides, X-pan panoramic film, uh, six by six film, six by seven film, six by eight film, six by nine film, uh, four by five, eight by 10, five by seven. We can support any of these unusual sizes and shapes uh, and different types of material. We're also much, much, much faster than legacy desktop and linear array scanners using drum scanners. Uh, once you've taken the picture in our system, you're looking at two to three seconds for the image to appear on screen. And by, by that I mean you can, you can take the picture and immediately look over and see the final resulting image. Uh, just as importantly, our system supports team workflows. This is what's being done 
uh, by those individuals there at the Digital Archive Group, uh, formerly known as CLIOSCAN, a service bureau that has recently picked up two of our systems and is manning each system with two operators. One operator loads the film, dusts off the film, and the second operator scans it and QCs the resulting uh, scan. By using two operators, they're able to get very high utility out of the equipment they've invested in and really delicately balance the investment in hardware versus staffing. So uh, again, faster at capture, supports team workflows, and then also as you see the rest of the day, we support a variety of post-process products, a variety of post-processing tools that will help you get through the post-processing element of scanning much, much faster than dealing with TIFFs out of uh, a legacy scanner system. We also have a very strong desire to provide the absolute best possible image quality. And image quality can be measured in many ways. Uh, resolution is definitely the most obvious, and we have lots and lots of resolution. But I think there's also something very special about our system in the way that it's very analogous to darkroom enlargement. What I mean is, in the days of film, people, except for the last five or ten years of the film era, or the sort of the, the predominant commercial film era, up until the last few years, people shot film with the intention of processing it in a dark room and projecting it in a dark room onto photographic paper. And our system is very analogous to that, to that setup. We use a standard photographic lens projecting light onto a standard photographic material, a photographically sensitive material. And we have that pointed towards a diffuse, non-collimated light source that is very much like the condenser head in a dark room and larger. The result is that the grain of the image, which is usually thought about as being like a pixel or being a, a, a one-dimensional point or a two-dimensional flake, it, it's actually a three-dimensional thing. It's an entity that has shape and form. And by illuminating it with a diffuse, non-collimated light source, we render that grain in the same sort of way the dark room did with the same characteristics of grain production that you would see on photographic paper produced in the dark room. This is very different than systems that use highly collimated point light sources, uh, such as a desktop scanner. Another attribute of image quality is the way that you handle the corrections to the image. When you scan a file to a TIFF, and you open it in Photoshop and you make adjustments, you are making changes on top of changes. That is. There was an original scan that had an original dynamic range, an original DMAX, an original DMIN, and you were making additional changes to that. We're working entirely in RAW up until you push the process button. So we can do drastic changes to the tone curve, to the color response, to the crop, and none of those things are stacked on top of pre-existing changes. They are all done in RAW non-destructively. This is very, very helpful, especially in items like color negative roll film, where you may have the desire to batch adjust and then make individual tweaks to, to certain frames based on those frames content. Finally, and this is a little bit, um, a, uh, this is especially important for those of you who have experience with systems that do not offer this. But our system offers absolutely zero sharpening behind the scenes. It was very often the case in drum scanners and flatbed scanners, that sharpening was applied even when you weren't asking it to be applied. There was some software wherein you had to know to turn a setting negative, as in negative 200 sharpness would disable sharpening, zero sharpening would not. And there were systems that applied it behind the scenes even if you applied all of the slider positions to their maximum negative or, or uh, lower position. Our system does not do that. This is incredibly important if you want to make large enlargements out of a film with grain, and you want to control the way in which that grain is rendered. You do not apply any sharpening. It's entirely up to you how to render that grain. So we have the image quality. Uh, we have the, the customer base. We have the speed. Let's talk now about some of the workflow, some of the questions we get. This is basically a, a long list of frequently asked questions for people either owning our system or considering our system. The first is emulsion up or emulsion down? And this question has a theoretical answer 
that we did quite a bit of uh, we did a, quite a bit of research to to check whether or not the theory and the reality matched up. And the theory would say that you want to have the, the emulsion that actually carries the photographic image, that carries the content of the image, you want to have that as close to the lens as possible, with as little in between it and the lens as possible. However, in reality, we have tested this, and emulsion up or emulsion down, even at very high resolutions, does not seem to make any practical difference. I, I think this is an, a, good point, a good time to point out that our system doesn't rely on attacking the film at an angle. Our system is, perfin, is, is imaging the film exactly perpendicular to the film surface. A lot of film scanners came in at an angle, illuminated at an angle, and used a lens at an angle to the film. And therefore, shooting through emulsion was highly problematic because you'd be shooting through a substrate that would then redirect the light. We don't do that, and our experience here is that emulsion up, emulsion down doesn't usually matter. There are a few things that you should be aware of. One, of course, depending on if you're emulsion up or emulsion down, you may need to take advantage of the rotation and flip tool. Here on the screen grab, you can see uh, flip is set to horizontal on the right image uh, because the Hagen Daz uh, copyrighted uh, slogan there is is backwards on the original image, and so we're using the flip command to get it back right side up, or right, right side forward. The other things you should be aware of is if we're dealing with a glass plate negative, that the thicker nature of the glass probably can affect sharpness. So we probably want to make sure that the emulsion is up towards the lens on a glass plate negative. Finally, if we're using anti-Newton ring glass, Anti-Newton ring glass carries a texture, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the anti-Newton ring glass that DT will be releasing later this year, but all anti-Newton ring glass carries some texture to it, so we don't want to have to shoot through the textured anti-Newton ring glass. We'd want to put that at the bottom of the stack and place the emulsion facing up with the substrate uh, contacting that anti-Newton ring surface. So emulsion up or down, uh, a lot of technical things we just talked about, but the bottom line is either way is almost surely fine, but please be consistent. You don't want half your collection shot emulsion up and half your collection shot emulsion down. Next big question we get is, well, how do I judge exposure? And what's often forgotten is that there was not one correct exposure for most photographic material. That is to say, if you look through uh, 100 photographers' work and, and one negative from each of them, the variety in which people would expose and process the different types of emulsions, the different types of paper and contrast ratios used in the darkroom to enlarge them is, met, is, is a huge myriad range. What we want to focus on is getting the best scan possible, and in general, that is accomplished by setting the thinnest area of the thinnest material in a particular set of scans to be nearly white. Now, this is the thinnest. I say thinnest, not white or black, because thinnest means the part of the film we can see through the most readily. In a negative film, the thinnest part will end up being a shadow. In a slide film, the thinnest part will end up being a, a highlight. But the thinnest part is the one that matters. Now, this is not as critical for color negative because, as you see in the screen grab here, the range of object dynamic range of color negative is not very strong. What does that mean? We're talking here about the difference between the dynamic range of the scene that the original camera was pointed at versus the dynamic range of the material the image was recorded on. When you hold the actual negative up in front of you, what you'll notice is that the black or the D-max, the darkest part of a color negative, is really not that dark. And the thinnest or D-min of color negative is likewise not that light. So the scene itself may have been recorded, the scene itself that was recorded may have actually had a very wide range of blacks and lights, you know, a black coat in the shadow and a white coat uh, directly lit. But that was recorded onto a medium that itself is physically not all that large of a range. So when we're dealing with color negative, it's not terribly important how we expose the film. We do want to generally aim to have the thinnest area be near white, but it's just not as important. When we get into scanning, uh, when I show you a little bit later, actually, you know what, I'll show you right now because we've been looking at slides enough. Let's go look at some pictures. Uh, I'm going to jump now to a set of color negatives 
Here are four color negatives, and these were all exposed slightly differently in camera. If you look in the top left corner, as I go through each of these images, you'll notice the exposure evaluation, which indicates just how much light actually made it to the sensor when we first captured these. But these four different pictures were very differently exposed. This one was very dark. You'll notice the green, blue, and red far to the left. And the far right one was very brightly exposed. You'll notice the blue curve especially coming very close to the right edge of the frame. But because all four of them are inside the range of the camera, as long as I correct the exposure before I process it to a TIFF, in this case I've brought this exposure up by a stop and a half, and this exposure down by three quarters of a stop, even though there's a two stop range difference in the way that I originally exposed them, when we look into a highlight, there's just not that much difference to look at. And what difference there is is owed to other parts of the process, as in what method I use to do the auto exposure, et cetera. So the exposure evaluation versus the histogram here, let me just explain that real quick. Exposure evaluation is without any change as the camera originally saw the film. So again, on the far left, the exposure evaluation is very far left. On the right image, the exposure evaluation is very far right. The histogram, in comparison to the exposure evaluation, is showing me with adjustments. So if we look at the far right image and the far left image, they're very similar. And again, any difference between them is owed more to the way that I did this than to the underlying theory. So color negative especially very flexible. This means that as I'm scanning a roll of film or a set of color negatives, if the photographer underexposed them or overexposed them, it's not terribly important for me to adjust the exposure as I go. I want to make sure that my whites are not clipped or the thinnest part of the negative is not clipped. Uh, and otherwise, I can really let it float and correct it in bulk at the time. All right. So how to expose, again, make the thinnest part of the material near white. And for color negative especially, don't worry too much about it. The next question, what aperture should I use? Well, this is an interesting question. In a lot of consumer lenses, it's very important to stop down heavily, especially for things like film scanning, because a lot of consumer lenses were made for general purpose applications and don't get very sharp, especially at the corners, until a deep aperture. What I'm going to do here is going to bring up a set of images shot at different apertures, and we'll discuss with our system how flexible we are on the aperture selection and what does and does not matter. So what I'm bringing up now is a set of five different exposures of the exact same piece of film. So again, this is one piece of film that I have shot at five different apertures. The aperture is shown down here at the bottom, but I'll just speak them out loud. Far left is f5.6, which is wide open for our lens. Far right is f22. And there's a stop difference between each one. So we have f5.6, f8, f11, f16, f22. Looking at the fine detail, things like the eyelashes in the very corner, what you'll notice is that there's a very slight drop off in detail between f11 and f16. This is due to diffraction, a phenomenon that happens when you stop the lens down too harshly. Now there's two things you could say about f16. One is that it is slightly less sharp, slightly less detailed than F11. The other thing you could say is that if I add a little bit more sharpening, then it's pretty darn close. I'm now going to jump to a separate area of the same image showing the same apertures. Here we have a part of the fabric on the model's uh, blouse or, or top. And what we'll see again is that the F16 with a little bit of extra sharpening looks very similar but if you look very carefully at the area of the texture, it looks a little less natural and looks a little bit more like it is a little soft and then added with a little bit of sharpening. If you look at F22, even if we added a lot of sharpening, F22 is simply not going to be as sharply rendered. So the bottom line here is that in general, we want to stay at or below F11. If you're being very careful, and you're using a very small, if you're shooting a very small piece of film, the smaller the piece of film, the earlier diffraction kicks in. So a piece of 35 millimeter film, for instance, you might want to stay at F10 or F9 or below. 
For larger film like 4x5 or 8x10, even F12 or F13 is still going to be very good. So as a rule of thumb, if you remember nothing else, try to stay below at or below F11. So then the next question is, if we're shooting at F11, anybody who's done macro photography or close-up photography knows there's not a lot of depth of field. This means that if the object is out of alignment, if the piece of film is at a slight angle to the center, that we will have part of the film be out of focus. There won't be that much depth of field at F11 on a macro shot. So how do we align it? And the first answer to that question is, you can't force a system to be better at aligning itself than it inherently is. If you're making sort of an uh, ad hoc hod, hodgepodge system, that is, you kind of gaff tape together some plexiglass and, and uh, maybe a C-stand, and you're sort of jerry-rigging jerry things, it's really gonna be very, very difficult to precisely align such a system. Our system, in contrast, is made entirely of metal at the base. It uses a professional, highly supported column. It uses a custom body that we make here in the U.S. to a one ten thousandth of an inch tolerance. And it uses our own custom lens boards and extension tubes, which are made to be larger in diameter than necessary to allow a higher level of alignment accuracy. So the first point here is, you need to have something precise in order to align it. And our system is very precise, very alignable, very durable. The second thing is we suggest laser alignment. Uh, any of our customers are welcome to, uh, to email us and we can step you through the laser alignment tool that we suggest and the way in which to use it. You basically place the laser underneath the lens. Uh, it projects the laser directly into the lens and it's reflected back towards the laser. And if the laser lands on itself, then you know you are absolutely perfectly in alignment. If instead it aligns, if it, if it appears to be at a slight angle, then you know that there was not a complete perpendicularity between the laser and the lens. And so you know the lens and the film are not going to be perfect alignment, and it's very easy to adjust to correct that. So you have to have a system that's good, and you have to be careful in aligning it. Uh, once it's aligned, our system is going to keep that alignment. It's going to be rigidly aligned uh, indefinitely. Okay. Next question we get is, well, how do we handle these crazy reflective and transmissive situations? A good example of this being a lantern slide or a paper slide which has had handwritten notes on it. How do we deal with scanning the object and not just the content of the transmissive material? Well, there's a couple things here. One is that it's really going to be very, very difficult to do that with a drum scan. It's not set up to do that. It's not set up for that type of work. I'm just going to load up a couple files here as a piece of demonstration. So here's an example of what you might expect. I'm going to load up a lantern slide shot with purely transmissive light. A transmissive light is not showing me any of the content of the surrounding label. By adding in an additional light source for reflective illumination, we're able to produce an image that has clear illumination on the label, on the texture of the material. I can see the manner in which it's mounted. And uh, it should, I should point out here that I'd be able to, depending on what I want to do, uh, I would be able to take this and make it even brighter on the reflective if that was useful or deemed appropriate. I'm going to unflip these images since they were in fact shot uh, emulsion up there. So now you can read those labels and you can see the number 171, you can see the authorship and you can see the location, all of which are very, very viable pieces of information, all of which would be entirely lost if we shot this on a system that didn't have reflective light capability. Now, this requires a couple things. One is that you want to use strobe. It's possible to have your transmissive and your reflective light source both be continuous lights, both be LED or fluorescent, but if you do that, you'll find it much harder to balance the transmissive and the reflective lights. If you use a continuous light source for the transmissive and you use strobe for the reflective, you can turn up and down the strobe independently from the reflective light source and without having to make any change to aperture or shutter speed. Simply dial the strobe up if you want this outside to be brighter, dial it down if you want it to be dimmer. In this case, I opted not to take 
a preservation route on the white of the outside. I wanted to make sure it was readable, but I wanted to keep the emphasis visually of the image in the transmissive area. In other words, I could have made the outside brighter simply by turning the light up, but I chose not to. The second thing is you want to make sure that your angle of attack on the light is very low. That is, that it's raking across the subject at a low angle. If we bring the light up to be at around a 45 degree angle, as you might have been otherwise instructed to do, what you'll find is that the DMAX, or the darkest part of the image, in the transmissive area is going to get flared. If you think about it, it's a piece of plastic. It's highly reflective. If you attack it at a 45 degree angle, you're going to see the reflection of the light in there. And it might manifest as a very strong reflection, or it might just manifest as a loss of deep blacks. Here, by attacking it at a very low angle, we've greatly minimized the change to deep blacks, and we're able to accomplish one image that has both the transmissive and reflective. If, however, it's really important for you to have the absolute best transmissive scan, it might make sense to shoot two versions of this image, one where both reflective and transmissive are on, and one where only transmissive is on. Those two RAW files could sit side by side. They could be processed to the same or to different locations. They could be used to be both presented to the user so that they can see just the transmissive or the transmissive and reflective. Next, we'll be discussing wet mounting. I have some pictures to show you, and I have some discussion here. Uh, but if you've ever wet mounted, you do know that it is a certainly arduous and slow process. It is a little bit air prone. Even if you're very good at it, it's a tendency that you have to do it more than once, at least a meaningful percentage of the time, because you'll get air bubbles in there. But wet mounting is the process of taking the film and sandwiching it in an oil substrate or an oil. Uh, it's the process of placing it into oil in order to flatten it and fill in any uh, scratches on the surface of the film. So I'm going to load up some pictures here to show you how our system is compatible with wet mounting. And then we'll discuss why I don't think it's going to be very common for people to do it. So here I'm going to show on screen four slides. Uh, the first top left illustrates the first step here of just placing in a anti-Newton ring glass or, sorry, a, uh, my apologies. In the top left corner here we show the placement of a clear glass stage. Uh, this is a third-party mounting station, and as you can see, our system fully supports a lot of third-party solutions like this just by virtue of its design. So I've just slid in here a legacy glass mounting station, and I have poured some oil down on the base in the top right image. In the bottom left image, uh, sorry, in the bottom right image, I guess we're going clockwise, I uh, could rearrange those, but it's uh, top left, then top right, then bottom right. In bottom right, I'm placing a piece of acetate over the film. And then finally, you see the mounted piece of film in the bottom left. So this is glass mounted. I, I could have done it off the stage. Uh, if I'm doing a whole lot of glass, sorry, if I'm doing a whole lot of wet mounting, I could certainly be wet mounting two or three at a time and shooting uh, and rotating them out. But here what we see is that we have wet mounting such that we can simply grab that glass and slide it in and take a picture of it. We can enable the, uh, we can use a custom mask in there. We have built-in light gates that help you do so, or we can leave it outside the image area so we can really see all four edges. Here on screen, you're going to see just half of a frame showing again what can often happen, which is an air bubble forming at the top. But you can also see how you get all four edges of this image. So we support wet mounting. Why do people wet mount? Well, originally people wet mounted because there wasn't really any other option. For doing drum scanning, uh, it is very difficult to mount that drum without a, uh, an oil to hold it against the surface of that curved uh, tube. It, it was certainly possible, but almost everyone using a drum scanner did wet mounting. Why would they do it? Uh, besides the necessity, people still do sometimes do wet mounting because it does tend to fill in scratches. The oil itself gets into the crack. If you think about the scratch, it's actually a three-dimensional sort of uh, crevice, and the oil fits into that crevice and fills it in. But this was more important when you were attacking the crack or the crevice from an angle, when you were imaging it with a scanner where the, the imaging head was actually attacking the film at an angle, and therefore, uh, and also was using a very harsh light source, 
such that any scratch was very harshly rendered. With our system, the diffuse nature of the light source, the non-collimated light nature of the light source, makes scratches inherently substantially less prominent. So wet mounting might still be useful for a severely scratched, uh, for a severely scratched image, but it's, it's, I think, less needed than it was in the past. In addition, in the last 15 years, of course, we've had huge advances in Photoshop's retouching skills uh, and, and tools, such that if you have a fairly bad scratch, it could be just as easy to clone it out with one click as it would be to try to correct it at the time of capture. Especially for those of you in, in conservation uh, situations, in, in institutions of cultural heritage, many individuals in that institution would probably oppose you placing an oil against, for instance, one of Ansel Adams' most prized negatives. So it's unlikely that many institutions of cultural heritage will need to or want to wet mount, but our system does support it in case you want to do so. As an alternative to wet mounting, anti newton ring glass can be used. The reason you can't just place the negative directly into a glass sandwich, just plain old glass, is a phenomenon called Newton rings. Anybody who used a scanner back in the day is very familiar with Newton rings. They look crazy. Uh, they're caused by the surface of the film, uh, sorry, the surface of the, the, it's caused by two surfaces that are very nearly flat coming into periodic contact with each other. And, you know, if you put a normal piece of film into a glass sandwich, you're going to get them. Anti-Newton ring glass prevents this by providing a very slight texture to the surface that you don't have two smooth surfaces touching. Historic anti newton ring glass tended to show texture at low PPIs like 2000 PPI, 3000 PPI, 4000 PPI, etc. DT will be coming to market in this year, the second half of this year, with anti newton ring glass that we have tested out to 5000 PPI without meaningful texture. This would be my suggestion for those of you who need to do four edge inclusion, meaning you can see all four edges of the negative or object, and don't want to wet mount, and have objects that would otherwise cause newton rings. But in the meanwhile, there are certainly lots of options for anti newton ring glass that will do very good, do very well, that will do a very good job. They'll simply show a little bit of texture if you're scanning at a very high PPI. Next, I want to show you a tool called the resolution ruler. This is a tool that, working with Phase 1, we had implemented in Capture 1 Cultural Heritage Edition to help users quickly determine what resolution they're scanning at. Here earlier, you saw that we brought up a 4x5 piece of film. We're going to use the resolution ruler to determine what PPI we are scanning this 4x5 at. To do so, we're going to click on the resolution ruler, and we're going to drag from one edge of the object to the other edge of the object. We can right click, we can say show on, on image, and we can say that this edge was actually four inches, right, it's a four by five, so more or less four inches long, and it will now report back to us that we're shooting at 2500 PPI. Let's repeat this with a piece of 120 film. This is a 120 roll of film, this is a 6x7 camera, so I'll drag across the short dimension here using the resolution ruler. I'll right click and I'll tell it that this length is supposed to be 6 centimeters. When I've done so, it will report back to me. I'm shooting at 2500 PPI. This is useful if I want to repeat certain PPIs. So, for instance, if my institution says we scan 120 film, at 2500 PPI, I can do a nice confirmation that that is in fact what I'm shooting at. And I can also place that number here into 2472 PPI, so the metadata of the image is correct, and somebody looking at this in the future will know exactly how large that piece of film is. So for the resolution ruler, we drag across on known dimension, we right click, we enter the known dimension into the, the system, and it tells us the PPI. Do be careful, a lot of film is not as large as it says. A six centimeter by six centimeter piece of film does not, uh, sorry, a Hasselblad 500, for instance, does not typically have an actual image that is six by six. Typically the image itself is, for instance, 56 millimeters by 56 millimeters. So it can't hurt every once in a while to actually use a ruler to measure the actual object or to look up the exact specifications of the film that you're scanning. All right, next we wanna discuss stitching. Now, our system natively can go up to 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 PPI, depending on the object size. But if we want to go higher than that, 
We certainly can by means of stitching. And our system does stitching by controlling the y-axis and z-axis, that is the up-down is controlled by a very uh, custom-made helical, the focus does not change, and the, the table itself is made of all metal, very high tolerance, doesn't bow up and down, doesn't shake up and down, doesn't move up and down. And a very controlled y-axis, that is the uh, fore-aft, the towards the operator, away from the operator, by putting in a nice deep channel into the top, we control the film for making sure it doesn't twist or torque, or move forward and backwards, which means the only direction the film is allowed to move is left and right. By allowing such tight tolerance on all those movements, we're allowed to stitch left to right very quickly and very reliably. This gives us the benefit of increased resolution, we have more pixels, as well as the ability to deal with unusual aspect ratios. There are specialty films out there like X-Pan, like 6x17 uh, as used in the Fuji 6x17 cameras, and some types of aerial film where you have a very wide aspect ratio. And we can set the resolution of the camera based on the short dimension and then simply stitch the frames to accommodate the wider uh, aspect ratio of the frame. So I want to show this to you now. This is a simple left-right stitch. Uh, it looks visually like it's a top-down stitch or a fore-aft stitch. That's simply because the film was turned to the left, right? So it looked like this originally. But since our object is actually 90 degrees oriented, so I'm going to just bring back the orientation. And uh, here we'll see how it looks. So all we've done is move the film to the left and take a picture, and to the right and take a picture. I'm going to show you what that looks like from the top. We place the 4x5 film into our 4x5 magnetic carrier. You can notice in the top left and top right of the bench, that the film gates, the light gates, are fully out. I'm going to bring those light gates all the way in. And then I'm going to open them up to take about half the frame total height. So here we see the frame slid downwards, so at the top of the frame is the far edge of the frame. Uh, that is to say that we're only capturing the top half of the piece of film. And the light gate, as you can see, is preventing any flaring from the part of the film that we're not imaging. And then we'll take a second shot, sliding the film off the other direction, and this time we're only shooting the bottom half of the film. So let me just bring those two pictures up, side by side. This is how we captured the bottom and the top. Now, to be clear, these are just documentation photos. These are not the images on, this is not the capture that I actually used. I, of course, uh, moved in much closer to the film and filled the frame with the film, so I got much higher resolution. And now I'll go back to those actual captured images and show you how we actually stitch those images together. Now, what's really important to understand here is that we're only moving one flat object exactly parallel to the sensor. So there's types of, there's lots of different kinds of stitching out there. There's stitching with your iPhone where you hold it up and you move it left and right and you rotate the camera so it's actually seeing different parts of the world. And the iPhone reshapes those images, redistorts those geometries together, shapes them together. And then there's this. This is called flat stitching. With flat stitching, we don't actually change anything about the geometry of the image. These images are ready to be lined up. They just need to go into Photoshop to actually do the merge. So here what I'll do is I'll process out two 8-bit parts, sorry, two 8-bit versions of this file. I'll bring those into Photoshop with the uh, new version of Capture One and a nice fast computer that's only going to take about five seconds. <coughs> Now we have two separate images in Photoshop. And I'm just going to go up to File, Automate, Photo Merge. I'm going to tell it to use the open file, those two files I've already got open, and I can leave it on automatic. If you've not used this in the last few years, Adobe has made huge improvements to the functionality of the stitching algorithms. They're basically now magic. Uh, I think the quote is, any sufficiently advanced technology appears just to be magic. Well, I think this absolutely qualifies. Photoshop is just going to take those two files, it's going to align them together, it's going to blend them, but even a very, 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 very slight change in exposure is completely blended together. And then it's going to give me an outputted file. I'll go close the other two files that are open, and I'll just make this nice and big on screen. And you'll see here we have one complete file top and bottom. Only takes about 10-15 seconds on a fast computer for a two-shot 80 megapixel stitch. 
You now see our resolution is 10,000 by 13,000 pixels. And if I go in here and I show you before and after, you get to 100%. Even if I show you where the stitch occurred and then I turn it back on, you still can't find that edge. It's a very seamless stitching algorithm. So, stitching is very good. Uh, it allows us to get to a higher resolution when we need even more than 80 megapixels on an image or if we're using a lower resolution camera. You can also do more than two shots at a time. Here, for instance, is a six shot stitch. So here you see the top left, top right, middle left, middle right, bottom left, bottom right. How do we accomplish this? Well, remember we only move left and right but we can do left and right, and we can actually take the left and right, rotate the entire carrier 180 degrees, and do it again. Stitching again helps you increase the resolution. We have 10,000 pixels to play with. We can actually go to 20 or 30 or 40,000 by stitching. Uh, we do get very, very, very large files if we do that, but uh, that is kind of the point, I guess, if you're trying to do a particular hero shot at a super high. Uh, the maximum file size of TIFF itself is actually only two gigabytes and we will very quickly get past that. So if you do one of these six shot stitches, you may find yourself needing to use a more esoteric file format like PSB or the uh, super large Photoshop format. Uh, but again, we, if, if you wanna go that way, we can. Uh, don't get confused here. Most of our users probably will not do much stitching. 80 megapixels for most film scanning is, if anything, more than you need for most types of film. But again, our system is very flexible. If you want to do even higher resolution, you can. Uh, workflow. Uh, we do want to make sure we crop out the null content. So if we have a left-right stitch and we have a little bit of black that is between the two frames because of our light gate, we want to crop that out. We want to be able to turn the layers on and off to do quality control of the stitch. One last note here on stitching. The higher the resolution you're aiming for, you know, if you're aiming for 5,000 or 7,000 or 9,000 PPI, it's really important the film is flat. So in that case, uh, if it's curled or if it has a lot of curl to it, consider using one of the glass carriers, anti neutron glass carriers, or wet mount the film. Okay, so now let's take a look at the basic workflow for dealing with color and black and white negatives. Uh, we have the negative tool, which allows us to flip the image and deal with it in a natural way. The rotation tool and flip tool that allow us to uh, opt to scan it with the image backwards and then flip it afterwards and we have the LCC tool. So let's take a look at those three tools. Okay, so here is a glass plate negative. <coughs> the glass plate negative is, of course, inverted as it normally is. I can go to Mode, Repro Negative, and that will flip the image and deal with, uh, and have all the tools deal with it as if it's correctly a negative image. Uh, by that I mean that if I turn the exposure up, it, the image gets brighter. If I turn the exposure down, the image gets darker. If I clip the highlight, the image gets brighter. If I clip the shadow, the image gets darker. This is really important because in the standard mode, right, if I then do the sort of old-fashioned hack that you used to do before Capture One Culture Heritage had specialized tools, you used to be able to just sort of make the highlight the shadow, the shadow the highlight. The problem is now if I go to make it brighter, the image gets darker. I gotta make it darker, the image gets brighter. All the tools work sort of backwards. So, by using the negative curve, we flip the image. By using the rotation and flip tool, we can switch to actually orient this back to be correctly uh, subject facing to our right. And if we look at the uncropped version of this, you'll see the text at the bottom is now correct, I-924, as opposed to being backwards text. You'll see with the image on screen, the repro negative and the flip command have gotten us to a good starting point. By using the auto crop, I've actually cropped into the image area. That's going to allow me to make my adjustments to this image based only on the image content. If I look at this image uncrop, I see that I have a black, which used to be white, right? This is a negative image, so this is the white of the unblocked light source. And I don't want to make an adjustment based on it. I want to make an adjustment based on the white and the black within the actual image frame. So here is the cropped image, and I can just very easily grab my levels and do an auto levels command. Now we got a great question this morning in this morning session. Does your system use all three color channels on black and white? 
And the answer is, well, that's up to you. It always uses all three color channels in the resolution and detail determination. So if we zoom to 100% on this, you'll see that we get lots of very sharp detail. So you can see film grain very clear there. You can see the retouching marks there uh, for the face. <clears throat> But we can also choose to render this in pure black and white using the black and white tool. Choosing to use more or less of a particular color channel. What I like about this is that we can use the color version of this in our archive. Using the, the color version of this may illuminate something about its origin, something about the way in which it was fixed or created, what chemistry was used. You can see on the subject's hand, there is a blob that is distinctly differently colored than the rest of it. This is something we miss when we create only a black and white version. It's something we can choose to either mask or not mask by playing with the individual levels. By playing with yellow here, I can make that more pronounced in the black and white or less pronounced. But in the archive, I have this raw file, which I don't have to make changes to, which I don't have to save changes to, that, that is always non-destructively edited with that original color content. The LCC tool allows us to map the amount of light across the frame, also allows us to map the color across the frame. The funny thing about our eyes is that we allow ourselves to, we, our, our eyes automatically adapt for changing brightness within the frame. So if the top half of the frame is just ever so slightly brighter or darker, we don't notice it until we correct it, then it becomes more obvious. The LCC, we shoot a blank shot, as we see here, and we take that blank shot, we correct it, and we apply it to the other images using a copy and apply. We'll be able to see this before and after. So we can get very even illumination and ensure that we're very faithfully recording all four corners, all the brightness across the frame. Now here's the big part of the presentation, right? I bet a lot of you are thinking, but what about color negatives? You know, it's not that difficult to handle black and white negatives. It's not that difficult to handle some of these other tricky issues. But color negatives, boy, are they tough. That's what you're probably thinking. But let me show you what we do here in Capture from Culture Heritage to allow you really great control over color negative film rendition. So here's an image on a mountaintop. First thing I'm going to do is use the on crop auto crop command. So here I go to auto crop, on crop. And I'll just highlight this frame very loosely, very, very casually, and it'll crop into that frame 150 pixels. That gives me just the image content. I'll now change to a repro negative. The next thing I'm going to do is white balance the image. The white balance does not need to be perfect. It happens that there's a white shirt in here. I could also use the gray rock. I could even use one of the beige shoes. I don't have to be perfect here. I just need to get generally in the right ballpark. If you see before and after, if you look at the histogram, I'm just trying to make sure the three different RGB uh, curves and levels, those three different channels are relatively in alignment with each other. Then lastly, I'm going to use the auto levels command. The auto levels command in Capture One Cultural Heritage has been improved from previous versions to include under Capture One Preferences two separate options that allow us to use this really effectively for color negative handling. The first is that I can opt to have the channels held, uh, handled independently. So instead of determining the black and white clipping point based on the RGB overall, I can have the red, the green, and the blue each treated separately. The second thing we've added here is the auto levels clipping. Auto level clipping allows us to select the amount of the frame we accept to be clipped in order to get a good automatic goal. So with those set, I'm just going to push the automatic level command and you'll see it. If we want to have a lower amount of clipping, that is we want to make sure our whites are not clipped, we can lower that number down. Here will be 0 0.01 and 0 0.01. We'll reset the levels and rerun the auto. And here you see we have less, uh, less aggressive clipping into those highlights. And I want to show you cross-process film. This is sort of the, the ultimate in 
bad color, right? This is a piece of film that was processed in a different type of chemistry than it was originally intended to be processed in. So the color is just all over the place. I'll use the auto crop command to get me down into the image area itself. Use the repro negative to flip it. I'll use the white balance to white balance very roughly. Again, that does not need to be perfect. And I'll run the auto levels command. Now you may notice the shadows are a little bit blue. This is very indicative of cross processing. It's not that the blacks are blue, it's the shadows are. So if you look right here, it's fairly neutral, but down here in the quarter tone, where it's a deep, deep mid-tone, you see a little bit of blue. There's a new tool in Capture One Culture Heritage uh, starting at 8.2, which allows us to adjust the shadow, mid-tone, and highlight color independently. It's very intuitive, very easy to interface. What we do is we just grab this shadow, <coughs> move it towards yellow. Once we're in the right ballpark, we can then use the outside edge of this tool to fine tune the exact hue or the rotation, and then fine tune the amount of saturation to apply. This would be too much. This would be too little. This is just about right. That adjustment is being made independent of the midtone and highlights, so those are not being affected. And you can see if I right click and do a clone variant. I can compare that with and without that change. Here on the left, we see a correction for the shadow. On the right, no correction for the shadow. And the fun thing is here, since we're dealing with a raw processor, I could actually keep both versions. I could process the one that shows the blue cast, so a preservation 16-bit tip. Perhaps the color corrected one on the left, I could process out to a standard JPEG for web display or I could process them both out to archival TIFFs or process them both out to be both archival TIFFs and preservation JPEGs. There's really no limit here in the way that we can provide multiple different kinds of derivatives from the same raw file. So if it looks like this software is pretty modern, if you've not used Capture One Culture Heritage before, if you've not used Capture One in general, uh, if you're coming from a drum scanner where the software was developed in the 90s and last updated in maybe 2000, uh, this is radically better, faster, and more powerful software. Doug, uh, I just wanted to thank you for, for doing a, an excellent presentation again. And, and sorry about the little technical glitches in the beginning there. Um, but all in all, um, we just, I just want to pass along that if you do have any questions, as Doug said, uh, please forward them along. We'll be happy to answer them. And uh, we should be, we'll, you'll be hearing from us again in the near future about future webinars, and we're always open to suggestions about topics you'd like to hear as well. Okay. Uh, well, Allison, feel free to jump in if there was a question. Otherwise, I will uh, just say in summary, our system is built for speed, it's built for quality, and it's built for conservation handling. It's very flexible. It's part of our overall system. And we look forward to uh, providing you, any, any of you that you would like, uh, testing. We'd, prefer, we'd love to be able to provide you uh, evaluation. We will be at several of the upcoming cultural heritage shows, including SLA and ALA uh, and SAA. I know that's a lot of acronyms, but SLA in Boston, SAA in Cleveland, ALA in San Francisco. Uh, we will have the system there for all of those. We have account references if you'd like to talk to people who are already using it. Uh, and again, thank you so much for joining our webinar. We really look forward to working with you in the future on this and other cultural heritage products. Thank you. Thank you, Doug.